In our last study, we studied a little bit about the Bible, its inspiration, and what we can, what is necessary for us. Right now, I want to study about the power in the Word of God. Oftentimes, the Christian life has been compared to that of a soldier. Apostle Paul made that very clear when he wrote his second epistle to Timothy in chapter 2 and verse 3. He says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The reason that we have to be as soldiers in the army of Jesus Christ is because of what is written in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking who he may devour. We are in a real life and death battle with Satan. He is unwilling that any one of us accept Jesus as our personal Savior. He is unwilling that any one of us will be saved. Therefore, because we're in this all-out war, we are also told in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So it says here, Take unto you the whole armor of God. As soldiers, it is very important for us to be protected. And here it says that we need to have on the whole armor. Now what part of the armor is the most important? What part of the armor can we do without? Notice as it reads in verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on what? Put on the whole armor of God. Although every part of the armor of God is very important for us to protect ourselves with, yet if we go out into the battle with the whole armor on, but we have nothing to defend ourselves, then we are in trouble. For that reason, we also need some weapons. The weapon that God has given to us is found in verse 17. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God's Word is the sword that He wants us to use to be able to defend ourselves in this battle that we are waging. Now this Word of God, this sword, has power in it. As we have seen in the Ephesians, a sword is the Spirit, is the Word. But what kind of sword is the Word of God? What type of sword do we have? How deep can it cut? Let us look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it tells us a little bit about this particular sword. It says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Notice the power of this word. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. What does it do? It goes down into the soul, it goes into the spirit, it goes into the joints and marrow, and even discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. Mind you, that is very powerful. Now, this is not the limit of the power of the Word of God. It is more powerful than that. It has not only the power to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart, but it goes beyond that. In Psalm 33 and verse 6, it tells us how powerful is the Word of God. Psalm 33 and verse 6. How powerful is that Word? It says, By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. So, the Word of God created everything around us. You take a look around, everything was created, all of nature, this whole earth, the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything was created by the Word of God. And how was it created by the Word of God? Let us just drop down a little bit to verse 9. It says, For He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So God said, Let there be a sun. And what happened? There was a sun. There is power in the Word of God to create the universe. All God had to do was to speak His Word. And as soon as He spoke His Word, those things were done. 
But that's not the end of the Word of God. From what did the Word of God create all these things? We know that all these things were created. We as human beings, whatever we create, it, we have to use something. This table was created out of what? We had to get some material, and from that material, we make something. But what about God? What did God create all these things with? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Everything was made simply by the Word of God. Things which are seen were made out of something that was not. God made the world out of nothing. He simply used His Word. Mind you, that is very powerful. But this God that we have, He not only created all things by the Word of His mouth, He does something else. He did not create it and left it alone to not be concerned about it anymore. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 says, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He hath by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. Not only did God create the worlds out of nothing, but then once, he was cre once it was all created, He is upholding everything by the word of His power. Mind you, that is very powerful. And then we go on to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about some individuals in this world who do not believe in the power of the Word of God. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5. It says, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the Word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Talking about the flood. What keeps all the waters from coming here and destroying this earth. What's keeping the water at a certain level? What keeps the ocean right there? There's only one thing, and that's the Word of God. If God would let go of His Word, there'd be another flood. And this is what happened back in the days of Noah. God's Word spoke, and the flood came. God's Word spoke again, and the flood went down. Now we know that this whole old world back in those days perished, verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens, verse 7, and the earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the same earth is being held by the word of God. The word of God is keeping that earth right now from being destroyed by a fire. But one day, God's Word is going to let it go and it will be destroyed by a fire. So what is holding this world up? It is nothing else but the powerful Word of God. So the Word of God is so powerful, it can create something out of nothing. And then, that which it originally created is maintained by that same Word. Because God created all things by His Word, He spake and it was done, it can enter into the deepest parts of that which it created. Because He created everything, that Word can enter into everything, even to our soul. The Word of God is very powerful, not only to create everything else, but the most wonderful thing about the Word of God, it has power to change our life. Let us take a look at the experience of David. You may recall how David had committed a great sin. He had sinned against Bathsheba. And after his sin, David had desired to have that sin blotted out of existence. In Psalm 51, verse 1, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness." according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. His desire was that his sins would be blotted out, that they would cease from being in existence. Not only did he want them blotted out, but he further says what he wants it done. Verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
He said, oh, wash me. He wanted to be washed from his sins. He wanted to be cleansed thoroughly. But he had to come to the point first. Something had to happen in the next verse. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. For a long while, David did not acknowledge his sin. David kept it under cover. And you know what happens with sin when you keep it under cover? It grows. And it kept growing and growing and growing until one day God had mercy and pity upon David that he sent Nathan the prophet to do something. He pointed out that sin. And when David saw that sin as it really was, then he acknowledged his transgression before God. Now, he had committed a great sin against Bathsheba. And as grievous as that sin really was, in reality, that sin was against God. In verse 4, it says, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. You see, he recognized that although his sin was grievous against Bathsheba, but Bathsheba was created by God. And because she was created by God, the sin was really against him. And so, David had to specifically ask for that cleansing from God. Now, David wasn't so worried about the consequences of his sin. He was willing to take those consequences. He just wanted to be clean before God. And so in verses 5 to 7 he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Oh, the desire of his heart was that he could be clean, that he could be cleansed. As you read this whole psalm, you cannot help but associate to yourself together with David's sins and his struggle and his guilt with sin. And for that reason, God has implanted upon us also a desire to be free. We go on reading, Make me to hear the joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Oh, he wanted to hear joy and gladness again. He could not hear it all. Finally, verse 9, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Oh, his desire was, if possible, it can be blotted out. And this is the desire that all of us have as we look back at our past life. Which one of us, as we look at our life, can we look back with satisfaction and say, Oh, I, everything that I've ever done was just wonderful. If we do, we're in trouble because we don't know the Word of God. But every one of us have committed sins. And this is the desire that we need to have, is to have our heart cleansed, our sins blotted out. Now, is it possible to transform the filthy, sinful life into purity? Is it possible to change someone who is a sinner into righteousness? Well, in Job chapter 14, verse 4, has a very important question. It says, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No, not one. Who can bring something clean out of something that was unclean? No one can do it. You remember the statement there in Jeremiah 13.23. Jeremiah 13.23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Have you ever seen someone change the color of their skin? Oh, they bleach it out for a little while, but the skin gets back there the same color. What about a leopard? He changes his spots. So we, who are accustomed to doing evil, can suddenly start doing good. It's just as easy to do that, which is impossible. In a book, a wonderful book called Steps to Christ, page 58, it says, It is true that there may be an outward correctness of deportment without the renewing power of Christ. The love of influence and the desire for the esteem of others may produce a well-ordered life. Self-respect may lead us to avoid the appearance of evil. A selfish heart may perform generous actions. Yes, that is all possible. We may do things only outwardly, but the inward soul is not changed. The heart is not changed. That corrupt heart is not changed. It still desires to do evil secretly. So what is the only way for a corrupt human heart 
to be changed into one that delights in righteousness. How can you and I, who are naturally, we love sin. You may be even sitting there thinking to yourself right now, Oh, but I love what I'm doing. I don't want to change. Well, I understand that. But you need to change. The Word of God is going to show you how you can have that change. David continues, the way that that change can happen, back to Psalm 51. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The only way for this change to take place is by that creative power of God. God must create it in me. He must create something out of nothing. We have unrighteousness. God needs to create righteousness. Oh, but that's quite easy for him to do. He created the world out of nothing. He took nothing and he made the world. He can take our sinful heart and he can create something that was not there before. In Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel 36 verses 26 and 27, it says here, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Oh, isn't this wonderful promise of God? God is willing to take away your stony heart. God is willing to take away your corrupt heart and replace it with something new. And what is the result if He replaces it with something new? Verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Yes, our God, He is willing to put His spirit inside us and cause us to walk in the ways of the Lord. That's right. That Holy Spirit of God, He can change your life in the same way that He created the world. He can create something out of nothing. This change is so great that when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 3, he describes this change that we must experience in our hearts in a wonderful way. John 3 verse 3 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this radical change, this change is a new creation. We are born again. It is starting all over again. Would you like to begin all over again? Would you like to start the whole process? You look back at all your life, all the things that you have done. Do you want to have a new slate to begin all over again? Well, this is what God wants to do with you in your life. Our life that was once full of the works of the flesh, in Galatians chapter 5, it has a whole list of them, verses 19 to 21. It says adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. There's a whole list there down the line. It describes us down to the mark exactly who we are. But you know something? God wants to make a change. God wants us to give us something else. Notice here in John chapter 3 again, verse 5 and 6. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless you have this new birth experience, you cannot ever enter the kingdom of God. Now, how do you get to enter the kingdom of God? Notice verse 6, what will happen to you if you are born again? It says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Yes, that which is born of the Spirit of God is spirit, and God wants to give you that spiritual life, the fruit of the Spirit. Let's read those fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Again, such there is no law. Isn't that much better than the fruit of the flesh or the works of the flesh? Isn't it much better? Yes, it is. But you cannot do that on your own. You cannot have the true love that comes from above. That love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To be able to love someone that is unlovable, that type of love cannot come from the human being naturally. That love must come from above. To be able to have that true joy that needs no props, that joy can only come as the result of the fruit of the Spirit. 
So for that reason, we need to have the experience of being born again. And unless we have that new birth experience, we will never have it. In Steps to Christ again, the same page, 58, it says, The things they once hated, they now love, and the things they once loved, they hate. The proud and self-assertive become meek and lowly in heart. The vain and supercilious become serious and unobtrusive. The drunken become sober and the profligate pure. Isn't that what you want? That such a radical change that it's called a new birth, that it's called a new creation? But how can that heart be created anew? How can we have a life change into that new being? How are we to be born again? How can we have that experience that is mentioned here in the Bible? Well, Apostle Peter writes about it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. It tells us the power that there is that can make such a radical change in a human life. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23 being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. How are we born again? We are born again by the power of the word of God. Oh, isn't that wonderful? There is power in this Word. It is able to change the heart. It is able to change a person that is destitute, that is corrupt in their heart. It can change a drunken per person and make him sober. It can change any type of a person, whatever type of life you have had. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what type of life you have lived. It doesn't matter. There is a God in heaven that has placed power in His Word, and that Word is able to change your life. We take a look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, it tells us why is it that there is power in this Word. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So this is God's word, and this word of God is able to work effectively in the person's life to make a change. But if we believe, if you make that choice to believe the word, it is able to make a radical change inside your life. Now the word of God is the gospel, for both have the same effect. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. What is the word of God? The, it says here the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. How do we know that the word of God is that power of God unto salvation? Let us take a look in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 13. Revelation 19 in verse 13 it says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Yes, praise the Lord. His name, who is this man? It's talking in verse 16. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, this is talking about Jesus himself. Verse 11 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Praise the Lord. Jesus is here called the Word of God. Also in John chapter 1, verse 14, it tells us what happened to this Word of God. John chapter 1 and verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14. What is it of Jesus? Who is He? What did He do for us? John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this Word is Jesus. He became flesh. He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Praise the Lord. This is the Word of God. This is why the Word has power, because the Word is Jesus. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it also talks about Jesus again. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Yes, this Word is God. This Word is Jesus. By accepting the Word of God in our life, what will this Word do? When we accept this Word fully and faithfully, what does this Word of God, this Jesus Christ, do to us in our life? Let us take a look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Can you believe this? This Word has such a power. It can change your life. This Word, when you accept it, it says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So what happens as you study the Word of God? What happens as you research these pages? What happens as you allow these pages to take control of your life? What happens? This Word, this creative Word, this Word that created the heavens out of nothing, this Word that spoke and it was done, this Word that is able to create inside you, it says right here, it's able to create faith. That's right, if you ask the Lord as you are reading the Scriptures, as you are studying the Word of God, this powerful Word of God that can change your life, as you pray and ask the Lord to take Him in your life, He can change you. He can create in you something you did not have. He can create faith inside your heart. Do you want this type of faith? Do you want this creative power in God's Word? Praise the Lord. That is what God wants each and every one of us to experience. This faith created in us by the Word of God is able to overcome the world. Now why is this faith able to overcome the world? Keep in mind, faith comes by hearing what? Hearing the Word of God. But once you have faith, what do you have? Let's look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. This is one of the most wonderful passages in Scripture. It says here, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It was wonderful. It says here, Whatsoever is born of God. How are we born of God? What did we read there in Peter? It says there what? That we are born again by the Word of God. And now, what does it say? For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And what is the victory that overcomes the world? Even our faith. How do we get faith? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So this Word of God is very powerful. It can change your life. It can create in you a new life. It can create the new birth experience. It creates faith where there was no faith before. And that faith then does what? It overcomes the world. It has the victory. Oh, let me read it once again. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So we see that in order for a clean thing to come out of an unclean thing, the Word of God is necessary to create that change. It is this Word that makes that change. Nothing else can make that change. But as we have read earlier, our God not only created the world, but He also upholds the whole world. What does that mean in our experience? Does it mean that God begins the creative power with the Word of God and then leaves us alone? Let us look in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. In other words, the same way that you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, in that same way you need to walk with Him. And how do we receive Jesus as our personal Savior? Well, first of all, as we read there, it says that we first of all come to the Word of God. This Word changes us. This Word creates in us a new creature. We become born again. This Word implants faith in us that did not exist before. All these things the Word of God is able to do. And then as we continue our Christian life, what does it do? We must continue in that Word because it says here, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. In other words, the same way we received Him, we must continue walking with Jesus. But now how can we communicate with Jesus when He is gone? 
Jesus departed from here. Jesus is up in heaven. He is not here. We read there in, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, where it was talking about Jesus upholding all things by the power of His Word. What did it say about Him? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He had appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. This is what He did. And He's there up in the Majesty on high. But how do we speak to Jesus? Have you talked with Him lately? Well, we can talk with Him because we know we can pray to God. But what about hearing His response? Let us look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation 19:10 tells us how we can communicate with Jesus. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, it says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You see, when we read the Word of God, this is the testimony of Jesus. This is the words of Jesus speaking through prophets. He is speaking to you and me. When you read the Word of God, like we mentioned in this last study, it is not the word and opinion of these people. It is the impression that they receive from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, to speak on the things of the Word of God. These things are the ones that are written down. When you read them, it's Jesus speaking to you and me. Christ is speaking to us today through the prophets. The Bible is full of these revelations. Thus we can say that since this, the words of the prophets in the Bible, is the testimony of Jesus, the Bible is Christ's words to us. We can communicate with Him through prayer and listen to Him through the Bible. As we realize and believe the Word of God, what will the Word of God do to us? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divining asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's right. There is power in this Word. It can convert you. It can change you. It can do all these things to you, but you must allow the Word to do it. If you never take time to study the Word, can the Word do all these things? Absolutely not. For this reason, in John chapter 15 and verse 3, John chapter 15 and verse 3, Jesus tells us a little bit more about the power of this Word. John 15, 3, it says, Now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Yes, this Word has power to cleanse us. It's power to change our life. Do you feel dirty? Do you feel filthy? As you look at your life of sin, do you feel need of cleansing? Well, praise the Lord. The Word of God has power to cleanse your heart. And how does the Word of God do that? Let us look at Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How can a young person cleanse his way? How can anyone cleanse their way? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. How can we cleanse our way? By taking heed to what is written here in the Word of God. With my whole heart have I sought Thee. Oh, let me not wander from Thy commandments. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. What should we do in order to have that power? To be able to live a life without sinning, a life without transgression. Do you want that kind of life? Well, it can only come through the Word of God. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, God wants this Word to do that in your life. And I'd just like to read something here from the book Desire of Ages. I really urge you to take time to read this wonderful book about the life of Jesus. On page 391, I just want to give you a little sample of a little synopsis about the power of the Word of God. Desire of Ages, page 391, and here's what it says. As faith 
thus receives and assimilates the principles of truth. They become a part of the being and the motive power of the life. The Word of God received into the soul molds the thoughts and enters into the development of character. By looking constantly to Jesus. And how do we do that? How do we look at constantly to Jesus? By the Word of God. By looking constantly to Jesus with the eye of faith, we shall be strengthened. God will make the most precious revelations to His hungering, thirsting people. They will find that Christ is a personal Savior as they feed upon His Word. That's right, as we eat this Word, as they feed upon His Word, they find that it is spirit and life. The Word destroys the natural earthly nature and imparts a new life in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to the soul as a comforter. By the transforming agency of His grace, the image of God is reproduced in the disciple. He becomes a new creature. Is that what kind of life that you want? Is this the type of life that you want? Is this the experience you want? In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I want to close with this text. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Is this the type of life that you want? Then right now, now is your opportunity. Now is your time to go on your knees. Give your heart to Jesus and then take this word. Take this word as the guide of your life, the map to your eternal home. Take the time right now to open your word and open your heart to Jesus 